Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. In today's lecture, we're, are, we are going to be beginning the Introduction to Microbiome Science section of the course. The um, purpose of discussing this now is to introduce this field that we'll be using to contextualize a lot of the work that we are doing throughout the semester. So for example, when we start talking about some algorithms, um, like those used in sequence alignment and those used in database searching, we'll relate those to uh, things that you might need to achieve if you were, if you were doing a microbiome study. When I begin talking about microbiome science, I like to start at the beginning. This field really began, um, I, I would say, about, um, you know, about 350 or so years ago with the discovery of microbes by Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Um, Anton van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch amateur microscopist who um, was really good at developing um, uh, light microscopes, and he created microscopes that for the first time were capable of 200x magnification. Um, this is a replica of one of these microscopes um, that, uh, that uh, was created more recently and used to create some photographs that I'll show you on the next slide. Um, but the way that this worked is you see um, this sort of um, pin up in this area um, right in front of the lens. And so the specimen would be pay, uh, placed on that plant, uh, pin. These knobs would be used to bring the specimen um, into focus. And as you can see in the illustration, you would hold this microscope um, up to a light source and that would allow you to um, obtain up to 200x magnification of uh, whatever specimen it was that you were looking at. Um, and von Leeuwenhoek was um, infinitely curious. He pointed these microscopes at just about uh, anything he could think of, and he's credited with the um, initial observation of all of these different cell types. When Leeuwenhoek uh, looked at things like um, seawater um, or pond water, he noticed um, little things moving around in those samples that he was looking at, um, and he called these animacules. Um, and these are what came to be known as microorganisms or microbes. These uh, photographs that I have on the right are um, a few images that were taken with replicas of Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. And so these probably look a lot like what Leeuwenhoek's first views of the microbial world looked like. Um, over the following centuries, um, a few other tools began being added to the toolkit for studying microorganisms. This included um, things, uh, techniques like culturing um, initially, um, and that could involve, um, for example, a monoculture where you try and grow an organism in isolation, um, or polyculture where you grow a community of microorganisms. Um, and polyculturing of micro, uh, microorganisms is um, a really um, sort of fun process. Um, you can see like the image that I have up here are what are known as Winogradsky columns. Um, and so this would be um, a system where you get some source of microbes that could be soil, that could be um, pond water, it could be um, uh, sediment from a pond, um, any other source you can think of. Um, and you put some materials in there to help them grow, usually um, some sort of um, carbon source um, is good. That could be like shredded paper. Um, that's what I've used before. Um, and basically, you, you cover these up so that you can keep moisture in those environments, and you just let them grow. Um, I would typically put one of these on my windowsill, um, and you start to see some really beautiful um, blooms of different microorganisms as you allow these to um, grow for uh, months or, or even years. Um, there's some really cool resources that you can find online on how to create these on your own, um, and it's sort of a fun uh, 
um, art and science project. And so if this is something you're interested in, um, you can create one of these um, in just a couple hours, um, very little effort, and would allow you to just observe how different microorganisms are growing in a polyculture. Um, but um, these techniques over the years led to a view of, um, or contributed to, a view of the diversity of all life on Earth. Um, and in 1993, um, this, uh, um, this diagram was published in a book by E.O. Wilson, um, Edward O. Wilson. Um, you may, may have heard of him. He um, wrote a lot of, um, he was a practicing scientist and was also um, a very gifted, um, a very gifted educator and writer and really did a lot of work on um, popularizing, uh, writing popular science. Um, and so this comes from a book called The Diversity of Life. Um, and what you can see here, so here he is um, attempting to uh, uh, draw a diagram that is going to illustrate the proportion of all known diversity of organisms on Earth um, based on different taxonomic uh, or categorized by their taxonomic groups. Um, and so you can see the view here um, was in 1993 that insects were dominant. So there were about 750,000 species of insects. And these made up more than 50% of the diversity of life on Earth. Um, you can see that some of the microbes in here, um, this would include things like the protozoa, um, the, some of the fungi, um, some algae. Um, and then in here, this little slice is bacteria and similar forms. Um, and then an even smaller slice for the viruses. Um, so this was E.O. Wilson's view of the microbial world in 1993. Um, more recently, and so in 2011, an article was published um, called My Microbiology by Numbers. Um, this was a review article, um, and the authors noted that in ignoring questions about what actually constitutes a microbial species, Estimates for the, to the total number of microbial species vary, vary wide, wildly, from as low as 120,000 to tens of millions and higher. Um, and so if we go back here um, and we look at this, um, this slide again, you can see we're, we're looking at um, you know, maybe the, the tens of thousands if we're looking for the single cellular organisms in here. Um, and so that varies even from the low estimate, much lower um, than what the view was in 2011. Um, and so we now know that microbial organisms, um, single cellular organisms, make up a very uh, large fraction of the diversity of life on Earth. And so this phylogenetic tree um, is a representation of the three domains of life. So the bacteria, the archaea, the eukarya. And what I've done is I've highlighted organisms. Um, I've highlighted multicellular organisms in this tree going back as far as the multicellular organisms go. And so you can see that the multicellular organisms make up this small clade over here. Um, and so like, for example, here's us. And relatively speaking, our close neighbors um, in the overall tree of life are things like mushrooms and corn and seaweed. The rest of this tree, everything else in here, is a single cellular organism. And so now our view is that microbes, whether they're in the bacteria, the archaea, eukarya, are by far the dominant organisms on Earth. And so what changed here? This is a relatively small amount of time, 1993 to 2011. So, you know, less than 20 years, we had this vast, um, uh, vast shift in how we viewed the diversity of life on Earth.
Well, this really came about through what we now call the great plate count anomaly. The idea here was that if you took a sample of microorganisms, um, so say something like the microbial organisms from this uh, mat that is surrounding a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, um, and so you can see all these, um, all this uh, colored material um, on these outflow channels from this hot spring. Um, these are what are known as microbial mats, and so they're sort of a mass of microbial organisms. Um, and if you were to take some of this and try and grow it in culture, you might observe one species, or you might observe uh, maybe tens of species. But if you looked at it instead under a microscope, so you took a fresh sample and got it under a microscope, you might observe hundreds or even thousands of different species of microbes. Now, when we started introducing DNA sequencing, um, as another tool in the toolkit for studying microorganisms, those estimates went up even higher. Um, so from that one sample, you might find thousands or tens of thousands of species of microbes. Um, you might not find that necessarily in the hot spring, but if you were looking at um, soil that was um, at a you know a lower temperature or the human microbes in the human gut, you might start to see thousands or tens of thousands of species of microbes. Um, and so DNA sequencing and the associated bioinformatics tools that help us make sense of the data that we get from DNA sequencing has really changed our view of the microbial world. Um, while we were focused on um, culturing microorganisms for a long time, we more recently now have focused on culture <clears throat> independent investigations of microbial communities. And not relying on culture has vastly, like I said, vastly expanded our view of the diversity of life on Earth. Um, and there's a couple of ideas that I want to um, talk about here that really have enabled this. Um, so culture independent and specifically DNA sequencing based investigation of microbial communities um, make use of the fact that all cellular life has a shared evolutionary history and some genes are shared by all organisms. Now, the technique that we will be talking about primarily in this class is one where we use some of those shared genes, um, one or more of those shared genes, as a genetic fingerprint for different organisms that are present in an environment. And so the way that this works is if you imagine some ancestral organism, um, imagine that it has this, uh, this gene sequence in its genome. Um, and of course, this is just a, a tiny little example. Their gene sequence would be much longer than this, um, uh, maybe tens or sorry, uh, hundreds of bases long. Um, thousands, even tens of thousands of bases long um, for a single gene. Um, but if we think back in time, there may have been some ancestral organism that has this gene sequence in its genome. Um, as time passes and speciation occurs, um, evolution occurs, um, we might start to see that um, organisms incur some mutations in that genome. And so, for example, maybe here we have a G to T mutation on this branch of the tree, um, and we have a couple of different mutations in this branch of the tree. Um, and as this continues, we see more and more of those changes uh, popping up in the present day organisms. Um, and so when we reach the present day organisms and we have um, say, uh, named some of these organisms, what we can do is using DNA sequencing, we can associate these different sequences, or sorry, these different sequence variants with the different taxonomic groups that we observe. Um, and so what you can see here is that this gene sequence um, is more similar 
in the closely related organisms because they have diverged from one another more recently. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in the semester when we think about phylogenetics. Um, but the other thing to notice here is that even independent of knowing anything about this evolutionary history, these gene sequences can serve as fingerprints. And so if we observe this first variant, um, TCAATGTT, that might tell us if we have a corresponding reference database of these sequences that we've observed an organism from the genus Escherichia. On the other hand, if we um, observe the sequence ACCATATT, that might suggest to us that we have observed an organism that is from the genus Thermus. And so this random accumulation of mutations over the eons gives us information that, help, that can help us identify and uh, compare modern day organisms. And so in this way, uh, uh, this sort of culture independent sequencing has um, become another tool in the toolkit for studying microorganisms or for studying communities of microorganisms. And a point that I want to stress that's very important here is that DNA sequencing doesn't replace these previous technologies. There is still a very important role for microscopy. There's still a very important role for culturing. Um, you know, for example, in understanding the biochemistry of an organism and the metabolism of an organism, it is essential to be able to grow that organism in culture. Um, and so sequencing is just another tool that we have to study these communities. Um, and so when we run one of these sequencing instruments, um, and what I've described it as on this slide is sequencing of the ribosomal RNA and um, potentially other marker genes, um, that is one of these approaches where we are targeting a specific gene in the genome of an organism, um, and we're using it as um, a fingerprint. There are some other approaches, like where you might sequence what we call the metagenome, um, and so that would not target a single gene, but that might try and make an attempt at sequencing, or at least sampling, all of the DNA that is present in a sample. Um, you use these, um, these can complement each other. Um, they provide different information about the communities. Um, but what we're going to focus on for some of the applications in this class is what I call marker gene sequencing, where we have a gene that we're using as a marker or an identifier of different taxonomic groups. So when we run one of these sequencing instruments, the output that we get is a um, file that contains um, potentially tens to hundreds of millions of DNA sequences. Um, and we could associate that information with the samples that they come from. And so um, if we had, say, 100 samples in a study, the output that we could get from one of these instruments, um, after a little bit of processing um, that can happen on the instrument's computer, um, would be the sequences that are observed in each of our 100 different samples. And this is where the bioinformatics really begins. Um, and so this um, is a um, what's known as a FASTQ file. This is a common file format for representing DNA sequence data and associated quality information. Um, we'll look at these in a little bit more detail um, at various times throughout the semester. Um, but what I want to show you right now is um, this looks like a FASTA file, which you may have um, come across in assignment one. Um, but what you see here is we have a sequence read. Um, and so that's on this first line here. Um, and that wraps around to this second line. Um, it's about 150 bases long, I think. And then the line that immediately follows this is some ASCII encoded uh, quality information. Um, and so what 
um, what happens here is we represent different quality scores using ASCII characters. Um, again, you'll remember the ASCII um, character set from the earlier lectures on biological information. Um, the only main thing to know right now, um, don't worry about like how you would interpret this, but these different characters represent different quality scores, which essentially tell us um, about how confident we should be in, um, uh, in the sequences that we have, or sorry, in the individual base calls that we have observed. Um, so this is the first about 42 lines of a massive sequence data file. Um, this file stretches on um, for hundreds of thousands, um, potentially even millions of lines. Um, and so you can imagine that as a biologist, when you get a data file like this, you need some help interpreting it. Um, and that's where the bioinformaticians come in. That's where you know folks like me and the people who work on my team get involved. And we try and develop software and tools that will um, help the biologists um, avoid panicking when they see this data. Um, and the main tool that we are using for this, um, or sorry, the main tool that we're developing for this um, is Cheng2. Um, this is, um, I think I've mentioned this um, a little bit in class so far. But this is a bioinformatics platform, um, in other words, a set of tools um, or a computer program that we develop in my lab. We are grant funded for this work um, to build to support our own microbiome analyses, um, but that we also make available to the microbiome community so that they can use this to analyze their own data. Um, the goal here is that Chime2 takes a user from that raw sequencing data, those FASTQ files that they're getting off of a DNA sequencing instrument, through their um, through intermediate steps of their analysis, so things like doing quality control on those sequences, um, things like identifying what taxonomic organisms are present in each sample, what taxonomic groups are present in each sample, um, and ultimately through um, what we think of as publication quality visualizations and statistics. So let's now um, switch gears a little bit and talk about what some of the um, outputs might look like, what some of the things are that you might be able to do with, um, with Chime2 and in a micro, microbiome bioinformatics project. Um, the first example that I want to look at here um, is based on those um, Yellowstone hot springs that I had up on the slide earlier. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit more detail on this now. This is a project that I worked on about 10 years ago now. Um, and so there are these hot springs in Yellowstone. If you've been there, you have probably seen them from, from the boardwalks around the park. Um, and often there uh, may be boiling water at the core of this hot spring, um, and then water flowing away from that. Um, and as the water flows away, so you can see this water here was 95 degrees Celsius. Um, as the water flows away, um, it decreases in temperature very quickly. Now, if we look all the way out here, where this is, where this says 63 degrees, um, you can see obviously about 30 degrees Celsius lower than the source, um, and you can see this sort of brownish, reddish, um, orange material in here. Um, this is a microbial, um, a microbial mat, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and so this is sort of a mass of microorganisms. Um, and as we move up to where it's hotter and hotter, you can see like the color of that mat is changing a little bit. Um, like we're seeing less of those oranges and more yellow in this region. Um, and as we get up here to around 73 degrees, um, we're seeing more white and a little bit of a lighter yellow. And what's happening there 
is um, what's actually changing in that mat is the organisms that are present. And so different properties of the organism impact the, um, the color that we observe um, um, when we look at those mats. Um, and so what we were doing in this project was we were profiling the communities along these temperature gradients and we were trying to understand how the communities changed um, over, um, over these outflow channels, um, which was this uh, temperature gradient. Um, and so we collected samples in the field. Um, you can see we have like some markers here that we were using just to help us indicate and annotate where we were collecting the samples from. Um, and we took these back to the lab we did DNA extraction on them so that we could um, essentially break down the cells and get all of the DNA out of the cells. Um, we then applied PCR or polymerase chain reaction to that extracted DNA so that we could isolate and amplify the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. We then took that product, which we refer to as our amplicons, um, in other words, the product of amplification, PCR amplification, and we subject that to DNA sequencing. And so we ended up in this project with a few hundred samples, I would say about two or 300 samples. Um, and we, um, uh, about two or 300 samples, and um, then gigabytes of sequence data from all of those samples. And so for each individual sample, we may have had um, on the low end, maybe about 15,000 sequences. Um, on the higher end, we may have had hundreds of thousands of sequences. Um, and those numbers, they don't really represent um, the, the diversity or anything like that. Um, they're more of a technical artifact um, where for some samples, we might see fewer sequences for other samples, we might see more sequences. Um, when we run this through Chime, um, one of the outputs um, that we can get is um, a summary of the taxonomic composition of these different samples. And in this plot, this is one that is generated by Chime2. Um, on the Y, or sorry, on the X axis here, we have the temperature that a sample was collected from. Um, and on the y-axis, we are showing the relative um, abundance of different taxonomic groups. Um, now, if you click on this link in the slide, you'll get an interactive version of this. Um, and I think we'll probably spend a little bit of time working with these in class. Um, but what you can see just from this slide here um, is that as we move along this temperature gradient, we're seeing changes in which organisms are dominant in those samples. Um, and so like, for example, we see like these middle samples, like these middle temperatures have more of this group called chloroflexi. Um, these yellow samples um, are a group called uh, aquafaceae. And those increase in abundance as we get to the higher temperatures. Um, and then some of these um, down here, the proteobacteria, um, are higher in abundance at the lower temperatures. And so that gives us an idea of how the microbial composition of those mats changes across this temperature gradient. Now, a lot of stuff goes into the analysis before we get to a plot like this. Um, one of those um, that's really key here is how we do the taxonomic assignment. So how we take a DNA sequence and we assign taxonomy to that. Um, you may have used a tool like BLAST before to try and do that type of, um, that type of an analysis. So you've got some sequence. Um, and you want to know, say, what taxonomic group it belongs to. Um, the, um, 
the scale of data that we have here. So when we've got, you know, if you have maybe a few 10, 20, 100 sequences, you could blast those and you could um, probably get a good idea of um, what organisms are represented by those sequences. And when we first got started with these types of projects, um, when our uh, sequencing instruments produced fewer sequences, that was really where we started with this, was we would use, um, say, BLAST to um, identify the, um, the uh, taxonomic uh, source of the sequences that we were observing. But as we get into millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of sequences, using something like um, an interactive web-based tool, quickly um, you quickly find out that that is not going to work anymore. Um, and so that's where um, building software like Chang2 can come in and can help us um, with this, building and applying. Um, and so one of the things that we will spend some time on this semester is looking at um, sequence alignment algorithms and then ultimately how those can be used for identifying the um, taxonomic source, of, or, sorry, the taxonomic or, origin of DNA sequences that we have on our computer. Um, or um, we can look at an alternative approach, and we will look at an alternative approach where we use some machine learning based techniques. And in particular, we're going to use a tool called Naive Bayes Classifiers to take sequences from our computer and identify their taxonomic organism, uh, their, their uh, taxonomic source. So by the end of this semester, you will have the tools that you need to take that raw sequence data and generate a plot like this. Um, and in fact, generating plots like this is something that you're going to be doing in your final project for this class. Um, while we are um, talking about these hot springs, let's just take a look at one of the organisms that we observe um, there. And so Thermus aquaticus, I mentioned that group before. Um, and if we go back to our previous slide, um, you can see that this orange in here um, represents this group called um, Dinococcus thermus. And that is the Thermus aquaticus that um, is included in there that I'm representing on the next slide. Um, now we actually see this showing up in most of our samples here. Um, and so um, that's one of the reasons why I just wanted to take a look at this. It is a dominant organism in these hot springs environment, or a common organism in these hot spring environments. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea of um, who this is, um, Thermus aquaticus is a heat resistant organism or a hyperthermophile. And so this organism not only lives, but thrives at these really high temperatures. And so, for example, in this 89 degree Celsius sample, um, that organism is present, is present and it's living. Um, and something that is very interesting about this is you may have, um, you may have heard of this organism um, via the TAC polymerase. Um, TAC stands for therm T. aquaticus, Thermus aquaticus. Um, and this is a very biotechnologically relevant organism because the um, polymerase that we use in PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, um, as you may know, that has to be a heat resistant um, uh, polymerase because in a uh, PCR reaction, you're cycling the temperature and you're going up to very high temperatures. Um, so in the development of PCR, um, the, ta the polymerase gene was isolated from Thermus aquaticus and uh, was subsequently used in these reactions. Um, and so this shows um, some really practical benefits for, um, for studying communities of microorganisms in extreme environments. Um, PCR has enabled a lot of, um, really all of our advances that have um, been based, or um, all of our advances that have built on DNA sequencing
um, over the past few decades. So, um, you know, without studying these communities, we wouldn't be able to, for example, have sequenced the human genome. Okay, so another environment um, that my lab has been involved in studying, this was also a project about 10 years ago, um, is the Atacama Desert, which is in northern Chile. Um, and so, as you can see from this photo, um, this is a very extreme desert environment. Um, some regions of the Atacama Desert, um, typically we call the hyper-arid regions, receive um, less than a millimeter of rain per year. Um, and so they, they're getting um, extremely small amounts of moisture. Yet there are still microbes in these soils. And when um, the rain comes, these microbes quickly bloom and they, um, they go about their business of metabolizing, reproducing, um, and then they go dormant again and wait for that next drop of water. Now, as you move from the hyper-arid core of the Atacama Desert into the Andes Mountains, just to the east, um, you get into um, a, a less arid desert environment. Um, and the water source here is um, primarily snowmelt um, and, uh, yeah, primarily snowmelt from the Andes Mountains, um, which you can see in the background there. Um, so very beautiful area, um, especially if you like deserts like I do. Um, and so um, a uh, student of mine went there um, as part of a grant funded project with some of our collaborators from the University of Arizona who study, um, who have studied the Atacama Desert for years. Um, and they collected samples, again, along a gradient going from the hyper-arid core of the desert into the foothills of the Andes Mountains. Um, and when we generate another plot like that one that I showed you, um, you can see that um, as we move, um, so what we're looking at on the x-axis this time is samples in the hyper-arid core of the desert. Um, so very low soil relative humidity up to soils with much higher relative humidity. Um, and one thing to notice in this slide is this one actually gives you a feel for the relative diversity of these different sites. And so if we look at some of these samples um, on the very low end of this plot here, um, you can see that there's relatively few different colors of bars. And as we move to the right, we start to see um, other organisms popping up, and we see a general increase in what we would call the richness of these environments or the number of different types of organisms that are present. Um, and so again, um, looking along some sort of an environmental gradient, we see changes in the composition of the microbial communities, this time associated with soils. Um, if we take a look at one of the organisms, again, that we observe there, um, this one is um, a very interesting organism. It's The genus is Rubrobacter, and I am not going to try and pronounce um, that species name while I'm on video. Um, but this is um, very interesting because it's a desiccation and radiation resistant organism. Um, and so this organism is known for waiting out dry conditions for years. Um, and um, it turns out that some of the adaptations um, that make it desiccation resistant so that um, help it avoid DNA damage that can result from drying out actually also helps with um, repairing DNA damage as a result of radiation. Um, and so just to put it in perspective, how radiation resistant these organisms are, um, if we're working in units of rads, um, 500 to 1,000 rads is lethal to a human. Um, if you're using radiation to sterilize a surface, um, on the order of about 100,000 to 500,000 rads are used. Um, some Ruberbacter species, 
can tolerate millions of reds. Um, and so um, really a, a, you know, a very unique ability that these organisms have. Um, and while this hasn't really been tested um, yet, one thing that folks are very interested in um, with respect to these organisms is because they are capable of functioning um, in the presence of these high levels of radiation, um, it's possible that, for example, they could be engineered to assist with cleaning of uh, nuclear contaminated sites. Um, there's a lot of, there's growing interest now in um, what's known as bioremediation, um, essentially using organisms to, um, uh, to reduce pollution. Um, and so this is a very interesting potential application of microbes for reducing pollution. Another really cool um, application is we are starting to learn more about bacteria and fungi that are capable of um, degrading plastics. Um, and so a hope is that by learning more about those organisms and the communities in which they live, we could um, get their assistance in um, dealing with the plastic pollution problems that we currently face. Okay, so I wanna take another look um, at these data. Um, and we're gonna do that by looking at um, an ordination of extreme environments. And an ordination is a type of an analysis, um, another type of analysis that we're gonna talk about this semester. We'll learn a little bit about um, these. We'll kind of just scratch the surface of this area, um, but they're very useful for interpreting this type of data. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click on this link. Um, this is going to load an ordination plot. And I've just got to do a little bit of work to get that to fit on my screen here. Um, here I'm using a website called Chime, Chime2 View. Um, you will get some experience with that over the course of the semester. Um, but this is um, an interactive um, three-dimensional plot. And in this plot, every point that you see represents a sample from a microbiome survey. Um, the points that are closer to each other in space are more similar to each other in microbial composition. Um, and so, for example, if we um, think back to um, those taxonomic plots that I was showing. Um, so for example, um, like this one, um, you can see that like these um, that fall in this like 20% um, relative humidity range, um, they look more similar to each other in terms of um, their bar plots than the ones over on the right side of the plot, um, or sorry, than they look to the ones over on the right side of the plot where we have um, like in this 100% soil relative humidity range. And so we would expect that points in this range would be closer to each other in space in that ordination plot um, than they are to points over in this range. And we would expect that points in this range will be closer to each other in space than they are to points um, that are from samples, um, say at 20% relative humidity. Um, now, this ordination plot, in order to help us figure out if that's true, um, what we'll do is we will color um, by features like the environment type. Um, and so I mentioned that this is an, uh, an ordination of some extreme environments. Um, so what those environments are, those um, red samples, whoops, um, those red samples over here are the samples from the Atacama Desert soil. Um, these blue samples are from um, the dry valleys um, the dry valleys of Antarctica, um, and so another very extreme desert. Um, so it is um, the Atacama and the dry valleys of Antarctica are the driest um, deserts on the planet. Um, now the green is a permafrost soil, so another um, typically arid environment. 
Um, orange are some geothermal soils. Um, and so these might be um, warmer soils. Um, and then purple are those hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and so what you can see here is that the samples tend to cluster by the environment that they're coming from. And so if you were to say compute the average distance between all pairs of points that are colored in purple on here, um, those average distances would be smaller than the average distance between, say, a purple sample and a blue sample. And so what that tells us is the samples from the hot springs look distinct in their microbial composition from the samples, say, in the dry valleys um, or in the Atacama Desert. Now, if we sort of turn this plot around a little bit, um, we can see that like these soil samples, um, like the reds, the red, the blue, the green, um, on average are probably closer to each other than any of them are to the purple samples. Um, like these purple samples in particular um, are uh, particularly different. And so I would hypothesize that those are the ones from the higher temperatures, the ones that are closer to the boiling water um, in those environments. Now, an important thing to know about ordination plots is that these axes are explaining variation in the data. They're not um, directly intended to be interpretable, although there are some ways that you can interpret the axes. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later in the semester. Um, and so for the moment, um, or really in general, these axes are um, a pretty abstract concept. Um, they are um, just grouping the samples or, or um, axes along which these samples differ from one another. Um, okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to show on this plot. Um, so that was a few different extreme environments. Um, and as you can imagine, um, those are um, those are pretty different from each other. What you find in the Atacama Desert is pretty different from what you find in a hot spring at Yellowstone National Park. Um, one of those environments is constantly wet, and the hot spring. One of them is um, drier than we can even really imagine um, in the Atacama Desert. Um, but I've got another slide here um, and another ordination plot. Um, and I call this one an ordination of even more extreme environments. Um, and so let me make some adjustments here again so I can get all this uh, in my display. Um, and again, I can see, you know, if I turn this around, um, I've got a few different clusters here until I start exploring the metadata about these samples. In other words, the data that is describing where these samples came from, I don't really have a good idea for, um, you know, what might be driving the differences that we see between these clusters. Okay, so what I just did here was I just shuffled um, the display around a little bit so the labels are off the screen. Um, and now I'm going to just tell you what these labels um, or what these colors are. <clears throat> so these red samples here are the Atacama samples. Um, the blue is the dry valleys. These like sort of pink um, or light purple are the Yellowstone hot springs. Um, the cyan are the permafrost soils. Um, and then the orange in there is the geothermal soils. And so I haven't told you yet what these yellow, dark green, and purple samples are. Um, but you can see that like regardless of what view I take of this, those samples are so different from these ones here, these extreme environments, that they basically make the extreme environments look like they are more or less the same. Um, and so here, you know, you might not know anymore if like the average distance between a red and a red
is smaller than the distance between a red and a blue. So what do you think these more extreme environments are? Take a minute and think about that. Maybe even jot down an idea on like what these might be. Well, it turns out, let me pull my legend back in here. That these here, this yellow, represents samples taken from human skin. The green represents samples taken from the human gut. And this dark purple represents samples taken from the human mouth. And so this is really, um, you know, I think that this is very fascinating. Um, so relative to like what we would typically think of as extreme environments on earth, hot springs, deserts, those are from a microbial perspective are much more similar to each other than these truly extreme sites like the human skin, the human mouth, the human gut. Um, I think this is just incredibly interesting because what this means is that from a microbial perspective, some of the most extreme environments on earth are probably the vertebrate body. Um, and that makes a lot of sense um, because the our bodies and our immune systems in particular are very selective about what organisms get to um, get to live there, get to be present on the human body. Um, and so this really kind of this realization um, really started opening up the field of human microbiome research. And this is something we started to notice um, about 10 or 15 years ago, driven by these marker gene studies. Um, and so one of the main things that my lab works on is studies of the human microbiome. Um, and if I jump back to my slides here, um, one thing that's um, you know really fascinating, you've probably heard about this um, a bit, but there are about as many bacterial cells in our bodies as there are human cells. And one thing that I find interesting is that we differ from each other far more in our bacterial composition than we do in our genomic composition. Um, so, you know, the difference between um, your genome and my genome um, is, is relatively, you know, very small, less than 1% difference. Um, so like greater than 99% of our genome sequences are identical to one another. Um, and so while those differences undoubtedly contribute to some of the phenotypic differences that we see, you know, differences, um, you know, between how we look or um, what diseases we might be prone to, more or less prone to, um, we're mostly the same in terms of our genome. Um, our microbiomes, however, might be extremely different from one another. And we're starting to understand that differences in our microbiomes can have profound phenotypic effects. And so they might, um, they might impact, for example, like how we metabolize drugs. Um, you know, so in other words, whether a, me a certain medical treatment is going to work well for us or not. Um, they might impact how many calories we extract from the same meal. Um, and so the microbes in our uh, small and large intestine are involved with um, breaking down food um, and the calories that we get from that food um, might differ based on what organisms are present in our gut. Um, and so, you know, having a healthy gut microbiome can really have um, very far reaching impacts on um, other aspects of our health. Um, and so, Given that we differ so much in our microbial composition, um, I want to talk about, or at least introduce right now, um, some of the ways that our microbiomes um, can differ from one another, or really that any microbiomes can differ from one another. Um, the first um, that I'll mention here is the community composition. Um, and so in other words, what organisms are present in an environment, so like say our gut or in two of our soil samples. Um, and this is um, sort of easy to visualize um, if you think about comparing, say, two gardens, 
Um, so the garden on the left, um, you know, might be like, maybe that's a vegetable garden. Um, and, you know, we see some flowers in there, um, but it looks pretty different in terms of the species composition um, relative to the garden on the right. And so these differences in what organisms are present is, um, is often referred to as beta diversity. And we think about that in terms of differences in community composition. A little bit later in the semester, we're going to talk about how you would measure this and how you would compare this. And that is the kind of information that then feeds into those ordination plots that we were just looking at. Um, and so when once we know how to do this, once we know how to compare communities of microorganisms, then it becomes um, relatively straightforward to go from something on the right, um, which is a little, or sorry, from something on the left, which is a little harder to interpret, um, to something on the right, which can very quickly let us um, understand patterns that we see. Um, so I said a few minutes ago, um, you know, that we might expect the samples from the lower soil relative humidity to be closer to each other in space in this ordination plot than they are to the samples on the right um, from the higher relative humidities. And that's exactly what we see here. If we take an ordination of those samples and then instead of coloring by environment type like we were doing in those slides a few minutes ago, um, if we instead then color that by um, the soil average relative humidity. And so we see these ones over here, which is on, which are on the low end. We see these ones over here, which are on the higher end. Um, and so um, we can see this pattern that samples from um, a similar soil average relative humidity are more similar to each other in their microbial composition. Another way that communities can differ from one another is in their community richness. Um, and we often refer to this as the alpha diversity of a sample. Um, and so again, going back to our garden um, idea here, um, you can see like on the left, um, we just have one species. We have that yellow tulip um, on the left. And if we compare that to the garden on the right, you can see we have that same plant in there. We have the yellow tulip in there, but we have many other types of flowers as well. And so we would say that the community on the right is a more rich um, community in terms of species, number of species, than the um, garden over on the left. And so we could apply the same idea to the microbiome, um, to like the soil microbiomes. Um, and so we might expect some samples to have a much lower richness than other samples. Um, and if we go back to the Atacama um, data and we look at the observed number of six different 16S sequences that we observe, um, so that is one way of measuring the community richness that is um, pretty analogous to like counting the number of species in the flower garden, um, although these don't represent different species exactly. Um, what you can see is we have relatively re low richness at the low soil relative humidity sites, and so like in the hyper-arid core of that desert. Um, and on the high end of the spectrum, we have a much higher richness. That's what basically what we expect. So we expect to find fewer types of organisms that can live in the very extreme environment. Um, so given these ideas about microbiome differences, um, a question you might have is, do these differences matter? Um, and if you want a good answer to that question, um, you can ask an obese mouse. Um, if you've never seen an obese mouse before, that's one there on the left. Um, I think he's pretty cute. Um, but this is a genetically obese mouse. And so this mouse has a mutation um, in uh, a leptin processing gene um, that causes it to, um, uh, to get very obese. Um, and in some early work on the impact of host-associated microbiomes on the health of uh, the host, 
Um, studies were done where microbiota was transplanted from the gut of an obese mouse into a lean mouse. Um, and when that was done, um, what was observed, so basically like you're replacing the lean mouse's gut microbiome with the obese mouse's gut microbiome. Um, and when you do that, um, if you keep the mice, uh, the mouse on the same diet, um, interestingly, it starts to gain weight. Um, and so what that tells us is that the microbes in the gut can impact um, say how, like I was saying before, how many calories you're extracting from the food. And so keep the same diet, but get an overweight, um, individual's microbiome, um, then the mouse will start to gain weight. And so it is a function of the microbes that are living in the gut. Um, some, some other recent work, um, like I mentioned before, has shown that the composition of our gut microbiome can impact how well medicines work. Um, there've been a few very interesting studies lately focused on um, amino, uh, immunotherapy for cancer treatment um, and showing that um, how effective this was, was correlated with some aspects of an individual's gut microbiome. Um, and so this starts to open up um, ideas for microbiome-based treatments. Um, and so we may eventually get to a point where um, as part of a treatment protocol, you would um, receive a um, treatment that would alter your gut microbiome. Um, we are also now starting to understand that the microbes in our gut through a few different mechanistic pathways can impact the central nervous system, um, our behavior. So really some very fascinating stuff coming out there. Um, and uh, in one of the next lectures, I'm going to talk about a project that my lab ran that was related to this. Um, we also have some funding um, in uh, my lab and Emily Cope's lab um, at NAU looking at um, the uh, impact or associations between the microbiome and Alzheimer's disease. Um, moving away from the human microbiome, um, there are some very interesting applications um, in forensics. Um, we will do a um, project related to this later in the semester. Um, and so we'll be coming back to this idea of using microbiomes for forensics. Um, tons of interesting work um, being done on the role of uh, microbes in um, things like fermentation um, and brewing, um, and, so, uh, and also in sustainable agriculture. Um, and so understanding food and soil microbiomes will help lead to new varieties of food and more sustainable crops. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, they might also help us with waste management. Um, a new project that my lab is getting off the ground now is focused on understanding the role of microbes in breaking down um, compostable waste. Um, so things like food scraps, um, animal manure, um, and landscaping scraps. Um, and there is some interest on the horizon of, um, or some, yeah, some, uh, some interest in trying to utilize microbes to break down things like plastic, which as you know, we have a huge problem with. Um, and, you know, um, the antibiotics that we currently have um, come from uh, 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 almost entirely come from molecules that were isolated from microorganisms. And so as our antibiotics are becoming less effective, um, you've probably heard about um, things like MRSA, uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, but antibiotic-resistant organisms, understanding microbes, their products, and microbiomes is going to help us avoid a world where we don't have effective antibiotics anymore. Um, and so, you know, as we um, start expanding this work on in microbiome research, we're also starting to add some new tools to the toolkit. 
Um, we may get to talk about some of these a little bit this semester, um, but that includes mass spectrometry to study small molecules. And um, one of the things that we're doing in some of our uh, more recent projects is um, studying the metabolome or the collection of metabolites that are present in a sample. Um, also using full bacterial uh, genome sequencing um, can help us get, a, get around some of the limitations um, that we, we hit with just sequencing single, uh, single genes from these uh, organisms to profile communities. Um, and so we may get to some of these additional tools that are becoming part of the microbiome research toolkit over the course of this semester. Um, okay, so that's where I'm going to wrap up this lecture. Um, look forward to um, fielding questions about this in class. Um, so please do bring your questions. Um, and in the next lecture on this topic, I will be talking in um, greater detail about a, micro, a human microbiome research project that my lab um, recently was involved with.